All right, welcome back, Next Gen family, to another edition of Mentor Moments. Today, I am joined by the wonderful John Dwight. John is the head of channel sales and partnerships at Next Insurance. We have so much to talk about today, all the way from managing teams to what it's like to go through an acquisition and a buyout. And, and John's here to just give us all of these insights, all of this energy. John, thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Good to be talking to you, Andrew. I can't wait. We're going to dive right in. Uh, I told you right before this, we're going to start with some rapid fire questions, put you on the hot seat, get you on your toes. Uh, so we're going to hit you with three quick questions uh, that the next generation, you know, wants to know a little bit of uh, light information about you. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Uh, your first rapid fire question. What is one book you would recommend everybody read right now? Yeah. Best book I've read in the last year, David Goggins, Can't Hurt Me. If you don't know David Goggins, he's an absolute machine, super inspirational person who's been through so much in his life. And I think I'm an endurance athlete myself. I got a lot from it, but I think even if you aren't, it's someone who's just an unbelievable inspirational person. I, I knew we were going to be friends the second you jumped on. And, and this book just reinforces that even more. But uh, we'll, we'll get into some more of that later. Your, your second rapid fire question for you. Talk us through uh, your morning routine and how you set yourself up for success every day. Yeah, interesting. Taking off that first question. So I, um, I'm not a standard person. I recognize that. I get up at five every morning. Being active and working out is super important to me. I wake up. Um, I used to be either going for a swim, a bike, or a run with pools less accessible. It's now it's a run or a bike. Um, when the rest of the family wakes up, we have breakfast, set and coffee. So, but the very first thing it's getting active and getting my workout in is like, that's the thing that centers me every day. Mm. I absolutely love that. Uh, and, and your final rapid fire question, what is perhaps one productivity hack that you might have that allows you to keep performing at your best level throughout the days? Yeah, I think um, personally for me, it is, I'll call it just being hyper-focused and I mean that in two ways. One is that when it when I'm on, when I'm working, that's what I'm focused on. Mm. And then when I'm off, I'm not focused on work at all. And it just helps me to be super productive between, for me, it's roughly the hours of eight and five. And then being off gives me the time to, to unwind and recharge and I'm ready to go the next day. I love that. I love that. I think that's so important. I think a lot of people are like, oh, I got to always be on, you know, I got to like be checking my email at 10 PM, but being able to have those defined focuses uh, can really help people actually get more done versus, you yeah. know, being on all the time. I think especially now in the COVID period when yeah. work structures are really weird, people working from home and there's no good physical separation. I think having, and whatever it means to each person, whatever mental separation is, yeah. however that looks, it's just important for people to find that for themselves. I totally agree. I find myself sometimes I'm in bed on my email. I'm like, what am I doing, man? Like I need some, some better separation than this. But I think um, being able to, to keep finding that, especially in this time is hugely important. Yeah. Awesome. John, you made it through the rapid fire round. We got some awesome information on you. We'll have to have a, a David Goggins talk post, uh, post this <laughs> interview. Um, but I, I want to dive in uh, right away into, you know, you and, and some of the work that you've been doing throughout your career, obviously uh, spanning multiple companies, multiple industries, uh, different titles even. But I think, you know, one that, that I've seen pop up a bunch for you is this, uh, this concept of partnerships. Um, and, you know, you've been in charge of partnerships in a few of your roles. And I think for, you know, all of our audience watching, what in your mind uh, are the key ingredients for forming valuable and long lasting partnerships? Yeah, I'll give you kind of a general answer and then get more specific. I think generally, the most important thing is that um, having the role really well defined in terms of what is the company's strategy and what is the important thing to get from partnerships. Um, partnerships can mean a lot of things. It can be sort of working with one or two big major companies yeah. on a lot of different initiatives. It can mean looking for companies that can help you fill product gaps. The partnership roles that I've been in have really been sales oriented. Mm. And the clarifying metric there has been revenue generation. Yeah. And so for the current one in the last couple, it's really been around, it's companies where they're looking for how do we create revenue outside of kind of our direct 
channel. And so working with partners is a way to become a new, a new area of revenue growth. Absolutely. Uh, I think what's really interesting is, you know, obviously, you know, I, I don't want to say you and I have, a, have a, the same role, but a similar role in, in a lot of ways. And um, I think a line that I always look to toe is how do you form partnerships where, you know, maybe uh, the partner you're asking for revenue from isn't getting revenue in return? And how do you create like a, an environment where they're happy, um, you know, even if one side it feels like might be getting at least monetarily uh, the more favor? Yeah. No, you nailed exactly the kind of the essence of partnerships. And it's part of, it should be part of the very first conversation every time is what is the motivation for your potential partner? Mm -hmm. What are they looking for? And in some cases, they're, they're really motivated by, by revenue themselves. In some cases, they're motivated by extending their engagement with customers, or they may have a gap in their own. So that's the first thing. I mean, it's kind of standard, but you talk about qualifying and it's as much. Yeah essentially qualifying the partner as, as qualifying, can you provide them something that's valuable and that fits their, their need? Absolutely. I think one thing you, you hit on too, right in the beginning that I don't want to say surprised me because I should have known, but somewhat surprised me is that the first focus is internal. What, what do you want from a partnership as the person, you know, as your company uh, to make sure that, you know, you're going into the calls, understanding if somebody's like, hey, this is what we're looking for. You can pull back and realize, you know, hey, this might not be a fit uh, versus just trying to appease everybody. Yeah. It, the reason it's super important is the obvious reason that you're, you won't be successful with a partner. But frankly, the thing that maybe people don't think about is you won't be successful internally either. Because mm. when you're in a partnership role, you're essentially sort of you have one foot in the company and one foot out the company. And the one foot that's in the company needs to be very aligned with your executive team and the rest of the company around what you're actually trying to do. Otherwise, you can bring a lot of potential partnerships that get knocked down uh, after you've put a lot of work into trying to structure them and put them together. Definitely. Take, taking a step back a little bit, and, and we'll, I want to get back to where you are now. But first, um, you've been part now of, of two acquisitions. Is that correct? I, I don't want to mess up the numbers. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And you know, you're speaking to an audience of, of next gen entrepreneurs, people that are building businesses that you know might want to get to some sort of exit, uh, like you've had um, themselves. So I, I wonder if you can talk us through a little bit about that experience and and what it's like to go through that, and then maybe like how you bounce back and go to the next thing when you've been so invested, uh, you know, in a company that's now been acquired. Yeah, there's a there's a bunch there. What you're asking, I guess I'll say. Uh... Okay, so first, what's it like to go through the acquisition process? The primary thing I would say is distracting. Mm. Distracting for the execs involved in it, distracting for the employees of the company. And I say that just because I don't know that people really internalize what really happens in a sale process, but it yeah. can go for months. You're talking to a lot of potential buyers. The most important thing in my mind is you have to stay focused on running your business and you have to help your company and your rest of your team stay really focused answer the questions they have. Obviously the acquisition process is important, Yeah. but what you're selling is the, is the company and your performance that has to continue. And, uh, you know, that's, it's, it's a, um, that, that's the most important thing I think to, to think about. Yeah. Don't, don't be too distracted by the shiny object that might be the acquisition and, and stay on, you know, what is the core so that the acquisition can actually happen. And they're not like, Hey, in this yeah. last six months, your performance has dropped significantly. Yeah. Cause remember what they're really buying is what you not only built, but continue to build. And yeah. so the best way to make yourself the most attractive tech acquisition candidate is just to keep doing what you've been doing. The major company so successful and got you to the point where uh, an exit became possible. Definitely. And then the second part of the question, how do you, how do you step away? How do you like go from, you know, you're fully invested in this company that's now been acquired to, okay, what's yeah. my next step, my next move? Yeah. So part of this, I think, is that if you're part of any small company, your role and your life is changing probably every three months, maybe every six months. Uh, every small company I've been a part of, it, it's just, it's constant change, right? And acquisition obviously is a bigger type of change. But um, my advice is you go through it, you see what things are like on the other side. In some cases, depending on your role, maybe it's great, maybe your role got bigger. Um, in some cases, maybe it's not. And you just have to be able to constantly reevaluate if you're getting what you want from your career and your, and your role in the, in the role you're in. That is likely to change pretty dramatically after an acquisition in ways that you can't anticipate before. 
but just be open to what what's there on the other side. And if it's not the right fit, it's not the right fit. Definitely. And, and I want to bring it now to the lens of, of the world that we're actually living in today. Uh, so for the people that are listening that don't know, your company uh, that you were working at simply got acquired by Flywire back in February of this year. And then you, uh, you know, went into the, the pandemic kind of uh, looking for what was next and, and managed to find yourself this new incredible role uh, at Next Insurance. So I think for our audience listening, talk about how you managed to, you know, kind of find that even during this time where I think a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, there's no way there's got to be, there's yeah. no job flow whatsoever right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the first part is that companies that are really performing well have continued to perform well in the pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so one thing that surprised me is at Next, we've onboarded uh, dozens of people. Wow. We're, so for context, when I joined the company, we were about 300 people. The company has grown over 15% in the time of the pandemic. So, you know, there are companies definitely that are hurting through this, but there's also companies that are performing really well and continue to grow. And then in terms of actually finding a job, I would say, you know, people always talk about networking. I think it's true more than ever now, especially as there's more, you know, LinkedIn is a bigger factor. Just people are able to connect much more through networks. And, um, you know, what people say is true, just, let people know that you're looking. Yeah. Reach out and get in touch with yours. The way I found my role is through networking and through uh, you know broadcasting that I was looking for looking for a role, and that's how that's how the conversation started. I love that. And and just for our audience watching, tell us a little bit about Next and, and what you guys are focused on, and, and perhaps what you're you know excited for uh, you know given that uh, things are still growing and, and moving for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. So Next is is uh, focused on small business insurance. And if you're not familiar with insurance, which I was not before I got in, but there are a lot of different pockets or uh, services that are have been started in the last five, 10 years focused on serving small businesses better. You see it in e-commerce and payments, in insurance, in a lot of places. And so Next is one of those players. And the, the size of the small businesses, there are tens of millions of small businesses. And then the gap in terms of what they had been receiving from legacy players and insurance and what they need was big enough that a player like Next starts out and within four years grows to be a $2 billion valued company. So to your point about what's exciting, that, that type of growth is really exciting. And more so than just the growth on paper, what, what growth really means is just that there's a lot going on. There's a lot of opportunity to come in and have a big impact. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a big... Um, need and a, and a big expectation that you can come in and have a big impact. So yeah. I think if you're the kind of person that's at a small company, you're probably there because you'd like to have that direct impact on growth and being in that situation is, is really exciting. Yeah. Speaking of impact, I think it's a great leeway into, you know, you've now uh, throughout your career managed a bunch of different teams. Uh, you know, some huge, I feel like back when you were at PayPal and, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, in, in more of the, the startup world, but across all of it, um, how do you ensure that, you know, people on your team are staying motivated, staying inspired uh, to keep doing what they're doing to allow you to keep doing, you know, what you need to do as, as, you know, the leader who also has a job of his own as well? Yeah, I, I'd say there's two things. One is that is at sort of the team level, which is making sure it's really clear for the team what the, the goal and the mission is and quantifying that. So, you know, in the role that we're in now, it's about revenue, right? And so there's a revenue number and saying, we're trying to get to this level of revenue and everybody understands a shared common goal. And then the way we're getting there is X, Y, and Z. And so yeah. everybody kind of understands the, the goal and how we're doing that together. And then the second piece of it is at a very individual level, everybody has different skill sets, expectations of their role, where they want to go in their career. And so being able to understand with people, what are you most motivated by? And in the context of what the team's trying to do, what are the things that really motivate you that you're interested in? What do you want to be doing now? And where do you think you want to be going? And I've, you know, it's not like I learned that through magic. I mean, frankly, that's the things that have motivated me in my career. And so it's the things that I try and work with when I'm, on, when I'm coming in with a new team. Definitely, definitely. I think so much in there, I, I wrote down, I love this, quantifying a shared goal and mission. Uh, to help people actually feel like they're all working towards something, not just working in their own silos. Yeah, 
it's it's uh, so it's interesting. Sometimes in one on ones, I'll forget, and a lot of it I'll focus on what the person on my team is working on, and sometimes I'll get the question back. Tell me what you're working on and what you're interested by. And I have to remember that it's as much, again, back to that sort of shared. It's that everybody wants to understand how things are affecting them across the team and even across the company. And that's probably even more important now when we're all distributed and it's a little harder to do that uh, by grabbing coffee or just being with each other day to day. Definitely. Uh, I think even, you know, going back, I want to go back to the very beginning uh, of your career real quick. And, and you know, you're obviously you're talking to an audience that, that is pretty young. And, you know, some kids are, are you know, pre-college, going, going into college, coming out of college, you know, a few years out, kind of working on their own stuff, working at different companies. When you think back to the very beginning of your career, is there one lesson uh, that you would want to share uh, with that younger version of yourself, having, you know, now been through, um, you know, different roles, different experiences, uh, you know, leading, uh, building all along the way? Yeah. So I'll give you a piece of advice or something I learned more in the middle of my career that I wish I knew early in my career. And that is to really, really understand what you're strong at mm. and to really have confidence in the things you're strong at and to understand the things that you're not strong or not motivated by. Um, and don't try to fit yourself into, don't try to do kind of round peg square hole with yourself. Uh, the reason I say that is that I think especially early in your career, it can be intimidating when you're maybe the most junior member on the team or you're starting a new industry or a new company and to feel like you need to fit into a expectation of the role that somebody else is laying out for you or an expectation of how to do the role. And it's very hard to do a job well when you're trying to fit in somebody else's skin. Yeah. And I had, ex I had experiences early in my career where I was trying to do that. And I look back now and it's hard to do that. I, it's not to say you should shy away from hard challenges, but when you are trying to really do a um, a good job of, of almost stepping back and evaluating yourself as you kind of go maybe every few months in a role and say, am I doing this the way that I am uh, executing and working on my strongest skill set and strengths? Or am I constantly feeling like I'm trying to walk in someone else's shoes? It's, you know, the, the jobs I've been in where I've been able to really utilize my strengths, yeah. I've loved them and, and days pass by like nothing. And then when I've been in situations where I haven't, it's a pretty tough slog. Absolutely. Uh, John, somehow we, we've managed to, to make it close to the end of our time here, our, our, uh, our interview. I wanted to, to recap for everybody watching three takeaways that I got from you, John. Uh, during an acquisition, always stay focused on the business. Don't be fully distracted by that shiny object that is your buyer. Uh, when you're working on a team, try to quantify that shared goal and mission so that everybody can keep uniting. Uh, and then what you just said too, understanding what you're strong at so that you're not trying to make yourself somebody you're not, but you can keep working at what you're doing. Uh, John, this has been incredible. I'd love to end every session with one last quick question for you, which is uh, when you think about the future, what excites you about the next generation? Yeah, I think if you mean what excites me about the next generation of leaders coming up, it is that I, I, I think that there is a, a stronger sense of, of confidence, I guess I'll say, in, in, in the people I work with that are kind of the next generation. What I love about that is that that's where you get great ideas is when everybody on the team feels confident and feels that their voice is, is equal and can, and can speak up. And I think um, it's so beneficial and, and being, uh, being a voice and knowing that you may be the newest person on the team, and it may be your first, your first job. But there's a lot that you know that other people don't. You have experiences that others don't, and you have new ideas. Mm -hmm. And bring those up, bring those out. I mean, diversity of ideas and voices makes teams much stronger. And teams that kind of operate, or companies that operate very top down, only with a few ideas at the top, they stagnate really quickly. I love that. What an incredible close to an incredible issue. John, thank you so much for joining us on Mentor Moments with NextGen HQ. Absolutely. Had a lot of fun.